So here's taking my first creation, the week special, uh, putting it to my back of my car to take it out the airport as an unlicensed trailer. The cops uh, didn't stop me. That was it. I uh, flew my first world championship. I made the team by myself. Uh, and when I was 24 years old, 25, went to my first world championship in Czechoslovakia. 1978, I got three silvers and a bronze, ended up second overall in the world. Uh, this was the team that I was on. I made the fourth spot on a five-man team. So this is just a, I'm going to flip through this pretty quickly. I don't have my notes, but I'll do it. So I built my first airplane when I was eight years old. It's my little brother. I couldn't figure out how to make the landing gear connect because it was beyond my technical capability at the time. But I got, I improvised, so I took that and I put it on top of my little toy wagon. I used to go down the street trying to dreaming about flight. Built model airplanes when I was a kid. That was, I was in 10th grade. We started building airplanes that uh, flew. Sometimes we were successful. Sometimes we were not. That's another one that we did. <laughs> I started building my first flyable airplane my last year of high school. I was 17 years old. While I was building the airplane, I was also on my high school first year gymnastic team. It's me on the rings. It's on a high bar in gymnastics. By the time I graduated from high school, I was still 17, about to turn 18. There, I'd built all that my last year of high school. Uh, continued working in gymnastics. Uh, I finally finished my airplane. I test flew it when I was 21 years old. So I was 21 there. Uh, that was it. Test flew it myself. Started flying competition aerobatics when I was in uh, gymnastics. Since I was basically flipping around in the gym, I immediately gravitated towards flipping around in the sky. So I immediately started flying uh, competition aerobatics. As soon as I could get checked out, that was the first airplane I got checked out in, flying a, what they call a sportsman category, which is the lowest. Eventually moved up to other airplanes, started flying intermediate category in this one. Eventually I uh, was fortunate enough to buy my first airplane. This is a two-place Pitts. Uh, started flying the advanced category. This was my shop. I quit school with no formal training in the beginning of my sophomore year at Purdue. Uh, designed my next airplane. This was our paint booth in the back of the deal. Anytime my employees complain about better working conditions, I show them these pictures. <laughs> so here's taking my first creation, the week special, uh, putting it to my back of my car to take it out the airport as an unlicensed trailer. The cops uh, didn't stop me. That was it. I uh, flew my first world championship. I made the team by myself. Uh, and when I was 24 years old, 25, went to my first world championship in Czechoslovakia. 1978, I got three silvers and a bronze, ended up second overall in the world. Uh, this was the team that I was on. I made the fourth spot on a five-man team. This was in Czechoslovakia where I won the medals. And when I came home on the airplane, I was building my next uh, design, which was the Weak Solution. This was a complete new design with the biggest engine anybody ever put in there. It's a, Airplane had 300 horsepower, constant speed prop. That was it when I got it flying. Won uh, 12 medals in that airplane. It was two times US national champ. This was uh, winning the world championship uh, with my two teammates in Hungary in 1984. Those were the Russians, those were the Czechoslovakians. That's my 20 medals, seven of them were gold. Started collecting warbirds, that's a T6 trainer would have been my first collectible airplane. That was my first fighter when I was 25 years old, P-51D Mustang. Started collecting bombers. This was working on it at the dirt field it was at, and I flew it back from Texas in about 1987. Had a museum in Miami we opened in 1985. Had, uh, you know, that was a typical hangar on the airport. Quickly outgrew the facility, realized I needed to control my own destiny because this was a lease situation, so I started looking for property in Central Florida. And uh, my life changed uh, on August 24th, 1992. Hurricane Andrew rolled through Miami. It was a Hurricane 5, 200 mile an hour winds. And I basically uh, came out the next morning to see what happened. That's what I found. 
whole hangar collapsed on all my airplanes. That was two weeks later, still digging out from the rubble. It turned into a giant game of pickup sticks, except this time with forklifts and cranes. Some of the damage. This is a rare 1929 original airplane. Uh, got just trashed. That was probably my worst damaged, valuable airplane, you know, that got crunched. Uh, that's it from the other side. And uh, I was, life was telling me I was done with uh, Miami. Time to move on with Fantasy Flight. Within a year, I was out of a long-term relationship, and I was done with competition aerobatics. This is how I found a week special. Oh, no, this is the Ford Tri-Motor. That was in another airport. That was a disaster. Anyway, then the week special, my first aerobatic airplane, that's how I found it. Crunched the wings. And this is how I found a weak solution. Anyway, so that was that. But from the fire rose the Phoenix, Fantasy of Flight opened in 1995. That's the facility. This whole facility was only ever designed to be my shop. Uh, the restaurant is the only thing that's going to stay right here. And then the two hangars, can't see the other one. That's my office right there. All this is going to be the world's greatest collection, aircraft collection, dream, restoration, and maintenance facility. I collect early airplanes. When I, I don't collect anything, I don't intend to fly. Curtis Pusher, little Benoit flying boat, started the first airline, reproduction, we had the engine made from scratch. World War I airplanes, the Howland IV, Fokker D8, Sopwith Snipe with an original Bentley engine in it. Moran AI, Clover Triflane, Otten is all me flying, Albatross, Peter Jackson's a friend of mine. We got a mutual fascination with World War I airplanes, and uh, this is one of the airplanes they built for me with an original engine. Golden Age airplanes like a Curtis Robin, Lockheed Vega, Spirit of St. Louis reproduction. Little Golden Age airplanes, these are actual characters in my children's books. Uh, this Ike Racer. I own these two airplanes now. That's my main character in my book, GBZ. You put eye, eyes on those, they look like cartoon characters. Early airliners, like a Stinson Trimotor, Ford Trimotor, between the wars airplanes, uh, Night Witch airplane, Polycarpop II, Beastler Storch, Stinson L1, Grumman F3F, seaplanes like this uh, uh, S39 Sikorsky. Uh, it's big brother of the giraffe airplane, which is the one that I bought from Tom Schrade. Uh, Rum and Duck. This was the airplane that was owned by Howard Hughes. He came to me in an exploration of another reality and told me he was going to help me get the airplane. The airplane's mine. I got a four engine flying by. That's a short Sunderland. Uh, picked it up at Cal Shot in Southampton and uh, flew it across the Atlantic. That's the last four engine crossing four-engine flying boat crossing of a major ocean. We did it in 1994. Fighters like a Grumman Wildcat, P-51C, P-40, Corsair, that's a De Havilland Mosquito, B-25, dropping watermelons at the Fort Lauderdale Air and Sea Show, B-26, last guy on the planet to fly one. Four-engine bombers like the B-24, plus you saw the B-17 earlier. That's a friggin' super fortress, that's a B-29. That's my biggest airplane. This is me flying my aerobatic airplane upside down off the south coast of Australia over the closest gas rig. Thank you, Grandpa. Anyway, Fantasy of Flight. That, this was the little hangar that we opened in the museum now. Actually, Disney was doing a shoot there, and this, they had this guy dressed up like Walt. That's what that job was. Anyway, this was just the PowerPoint on stuff. You know, I heli ski, and uh, I've always felt this was the mantra do not follow where the path may lead, go instead where there's no path and leave a trail. So that's what I intend to do. Anyway, why uh, fantasy? It's the first spark of imagination. If you remember, my mission statement is to light that spark within. Why flight? It's the most profound metaphor of pushing our boundaries, reaching beyond ourselves, and freedom. I defy you to come up with a better one. In the physical, we all relate to reaching for the sky, reaching for the stars. But within us, we soar in our imagination and we fly in our dreams. And I never finished that, but these two parallel paths, I had the metaphysical and the physical fascination with flight. When I couldn't be successful with fantasy of flight, all of a sudden I realized it was about the metaphor. And it was at that point my two parallel paths merged and became one. Fantasy of flight concept, everybody's on a journey. I had to come up with something everybody could agree upon. Our perception of reality changes at each step. 
something draws us beyond ourselves. To my knowledge, nobody's ever defined, branded, or created a product around this. That's the key to what Fantasy of Flight's about. And if basically everyone's on a journey, our perception changes at each step, something draws us beyond ourselves. Fantasy of Flight is that which draws us beyond what we think we are, which will always be a limitation, to become more of what we truly are, which is infinite potential. The tagline that I created 10 years before I understood what the meaning was is actually the definition of fantasy of flight. It was only intended to be a play on words when I originally trademarked it, and I realized later it was the definition. It's an attraction on a higher plane. That's the way this whole thing has worked out for me. I mentioned this before to current industries about for the masses, fantasy of flights for the individual. We're about, uh, current industries about escaping from reality. We're about engaging reality. They're about fake imagination. We're about real imagination. So the new approach is, I explained this before, it's a human experience at its core level, something we can all agree upon, no value. Delivered through entertainment, the most profound delivery method to plant seeds of change that's ever been created. We're open and receptive, and the most profound way to learn and grow that will ever be created, nothing will ever surpass that self-discovery. So that's the key to how we deliver everything to fantasy of life. Oh, these are the audio experiences. Write children's books, that was my first one. That was my second one. That's my third one, that's my park icon character. That's him with his head in the sand when we first meet him in the book. This is the property where the current facility is there. That's the main facility that we opened. This we built. This is where Fantasy of Flight in the future is gonna be. There's another view there, so I've got two runways. Got lake access for vintage seaplanes, and in the long run, I've got a whole big chunk of property that I either already own or I'm going to own. There's three aspects to the park system because the concept of going beyond ourselves is timeless. 100,000 years we were drawn beyond ourselves, today we are, and in a million years we will be too. So there's actually three parks. I own all those trademarks. Uh, when we finally broke our logo down into the three basic elements, all of a sudden I realized that uh, the bird symbolized humanity's fascination with flight in the past. The crescent moon symbolizes the present because it's within our grasp, we've been there. The star symbolizes our future. That was the original logo. Anyway, so that basically was that. Anything else basically related to uh, my other deal. So other than that, um, I got a big dream. I want everybody to have big dreams. I want everybody to find them. And I'm going to find a way to help them fulfill their own dreams. Out for now.